Brother Bob's sermon text will be 2 Thessalonians 3, 13. But we are bound to give thanks always of the Lord because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Dear Heavenly Father, I wanna play, pray for Brother Bob that he will have strength to speak and that everyone will have ears to hear, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for reading that text. God has chosen his people through sanctification. He's already read the text, so I'll tell you, you know, God, there is such a thing as the people of God. Now that sounds pretty specific, doesn't it? There's the people of God. They belong to God. They're his people. Before the creation of man, a time really we know very little about, God had created principalities and powers in heavenly places. Remember, he created the angelic order, cherubims and seraphims, the four living creatures. These, they don't question the validity of God. They're there in his presence all the time. <laughs> the watchers, remember the watchers. They've seen everything that God's done. Not only do they see it, to some degree they understand it. But see, God wanted to be known. He wanted to open up. God wanted, wanted these, what good is it to have all these characteristics if, if no one understands them? God wanted to be known. So he, he purposed a plan, a way that he could divulge these aspects of his character and they would be understood. They would be known. God would be known. Do you know God? See, you're going to know him a lot better. <laughs> See, we're just touching the hem of the garment, brother. We're just touching the hem of the garment. We're, in other words, we're being prepared to know him better, to see him more clearly, to understand when God does something. We can understand. That's called glorifying God. <laughs> we want to glorify God. It's important to see that all the works of God, all of them, from the very beginning, are really one work. See, everything that God's doing is falling together in one. He's bringing all things together in one, in Christ Jesus. But see, as we, as we are in Christ and as we live and move and have our being in Him, we're becoming a part of the big plan. <laughs> You know, we see in part, we know in part, but it's not always going to be that way. We're, 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 be, we're one with the one who made everything. Oh, praise God. When we consider the host of heaven, you see, you see him small. Sometimes you can seem small to yourself. Well, see, that won't always be that way. You consider the host of heaven, it's, it's huge, and it's, there's angels without number. Thousands and thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. And they minister to the Lord. But not one of them, in all of their beauty, and all of their grandeur, not one of them was made in the image and similitude of God. That was man. You were made in the image of God. No wonder God can talk to you the way he talks to you. You've been made in the image and the similitude of God. God can tell you things that he can't tell anybody else. He can set his love on you and it can change you. Why? Because you've been made in his image. This is a grand, a grand purpose. Angelic orders can look at you and see things they can't see any place else. Why? Because God is in you. 
both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's working out his eternal purpose in those whom he's created in his image. It makes sense. Well, when, you, when you sit down and, you, and you're given wisdom and knowledge and you, you grow in it, you say, God's done everything well. If there's anything he's done that's insufficient. God's in the process of bringing things together in the sun because that's the best way to do it. He isn't bringing everything in one in Robert Cobb. See, I have a measure. We all have a measure. But when we get there and all the measures are brought together in one, it will perfectly reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, this is his body. <laughs> oh, yes. God's never really been without a people. I mean, you know, like I said before, there was all the angelic order. But see, even since he created man, look at this. And remember the time of Noah? He said, well, there's only one man, Noah. But there was Noah. <laughs> God wasn't without a people. He had Noah, right? In Mesopotamia, God had Abram. He had Abram there. It wasn't without a, a witness. God had a man there. In Jericho, shall I say it? God had Rahab. <laughs> she was there waiting, waiting for God to show up. He delivered her, didn't he? In the house of Saul, you say, well, that was a bad place. He had Jonathan. He also had Mephibosheth, remember? In Moab, you say, well, that's a bad place. God had Ruth just waiting there. God was going to send somebody over there. He was going to send somebody, and Ruth wasn't going to stay in Moab very long, was she? She was going to become an Israelite. She said, my God's going to, your God's going to be my God. Well, how'd that happen? God's moving. There were even, there were even a few in Sardis. Now, I'm sure there were some people that would say, really? Yes, there was even a few in Sardis that hadn't defiled their garments. Now in Thessalonica, now this is what our text comes from, the Thessalonian brethren. In Thessalonica, God had some brethren that were beloved of the Lord. Now, that's a great status. You say, well, well I'm all about have status symbols. This is, this is a good status. Are you beloved of the Lord? Has God set his love upon you? I don't believe there's any better place to be. I mean, all the riches of the world, whatever they may be, they have a, a shelf life. There's going to come a time when you're going to have to give them up. So while you have them, use them wisely, because you only got them for a little while. Then you get to give them back. Now why? You see, why? There was some? There was some? Yeah, that's what it says. It does say some, even in the original language, it's some. There was a few in Sardis, and there were some in Thessalonica, not everybody, or some of them chased Paul out, wanted to kill him. That's what some people in Thessalonica did, but not all of them. Not all of them. There was some that was beloved of the Lord. We don't have to guess about why. He tells us, because, you want to know why they were beloved of the Lord? Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. These are the means through which God works in people. I'm not going to launch out tonight into a big discourse on election and predestination because Brother, Brother Jason's going to do that. I don't have to. Brother Jason's going to do it for me. But I will say that there is no person that's called by Christ Jesus to a different calling than sanctification of the truth and belief, uh, sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. There is no other calling. God doesn't call people to something different than that. He calls you to be sanctified and to believe the truth. So I ask you tonight, are you, are you being sanctified by the spirit? Do you believe the record that God's given of his son? Well, happy are ye, happy indeed. God 
is proving to you that you are beloved of him. Now, I'll tell you, if that doesn't create confidence in you, nothing will. See, anything else is like a trumped-up confidence. It's like a pretend confidence, and it won't stand to the judgment. But if you're being sanctified, if you're being sanctified by the Spirit, you'll be able to stand on the day of judgment. Why? Because he's got everything out of you that God can't receive. Isn't that what sanctification's all about? Getting some of those things out. All the time he's getting some things out. He's, see, God's merciful now. If he's revealed every single thing they had to go when you first came in, it would overwhelm you, wouldn't it? But see, he's merciful. And he's bringing us along, weeding out the things that can't get in there. To where on that day we won't have a red face when we stand before God. God doesn't call people into personal or simplistic views of salvation. That isn't God who calls people into that. Now some men do. They'll try to simplify. Let's just simplify the gospel. Well, I don't want a simplified gospel. I need the gospel just as, just as God gave it to us. Which means you're going to have to dig in. You're going to have to get some wisdom with that knowledge, and you're going to have to apply yourself. Now, I know that'll, that, that means you've got to lay down your life. Yeah. But really, does God open up his gospel to anybody who isn't willing? If Jesus would lay down his life for you, do we possibly think that God's going to bless us if we don't lay our life down for the brethren? Well, I know, I know, I know. Honestly, I'm preaching to the choir, right? I know you, brethren. I know that you're willing to lay down your life for the Lord Jesus. I know it. Amen. I've witnessed it. But these things need to be said. Now, the big picture is that we who have believed are chosen to salvation. And I don't have to qualify that because the apostle just qualified it. Amen. That's what he said. So, you know, I'm not going to dwell on that long because he did. Amen. Chosen to salvation. Now, I like that. Do you like the sound of that? I like the sound of that. God's in control and I'm saved because he wants me to be. God doesn't call or choose people to be spectators in the matters of salvation. We've entered into salvation. We, in other words, we believe the record that God's given of his son and we believe it so much that we've abandoned our previous life and we've pursued him, pursued him above every other interest. I, don't, I think it's extremely important that this point be established in the minds of those who make a profession of having the spirit of God. God's spirit doesn't lead anybody to sin, ever. So if I sin, I'm acting outside the will of God, outside the leading of the Holy Spirit, and I'm in the flesh, because that's the only place you can sin, right? So I've abandoned my profession. So the, Does a profession of faith, just a profession, if I just say to you, I believe, and yet I don't have any works to prove that I believe? What if I just say, I believe everything that's in the Bible? But I don't, haven't really read the Bible. Or how about this? If I have read the Bible, which would even make it worse, and I say, I believe we have everything in there, but I just got this little habit here called fornication. I just can't help myself. It, well, see, it sounds absurd, but we got a world that's out there doing this stuff now. A religious world. What, what does that tell you? They don't understand what sanctification even means. See, many are now professing to know Jesus, yet in their works, they deny him. Now, here's the word from the king on this matter. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father. Are you doing the will of... In other words, have you believed on Jesus? Are you... Cru are you have you taken up your cross... And following after the lamb wherever he goes, Jesus will go places that will hurt. Jesus does this on purpose now. 
Jesus isn't playing games. Jesus doesn't have any candy-coated gospel. Amen. It's going to cost you your life. Amen. And if it doesn't, you're not following Jesus. Amen. You're following some other Jesus. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Now I'll profess unto them, you did pretty good. I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. That sounded pretty good what they said, didn't it? Didn't it sound pretty good? They're casting out devils now. We don't want to be critical. Let's not be critical. We don't be critical. Jesus, that sounds like you're being critical. He is being critical. Isn't it? Wouldn't you say that that's critical? He's, it's pretty critical when in the end he, th he cast you out. That's critical. I don't know anybody can live through that, do you? Critical. It's true. See, ultimately, everyone's going to bow the knee to Jesus. We know that we have it in the, in the, by revelation. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. But not every profession is going to lead unto salvation. There's some that are going to bow the knee and say, yes, you're the Lord. And then they're going to depart forevermore. See, we, we, the great thing about salvation is it doesn't have to happen to you. It doesn't have to happen. That's the good news. Jesus died, yea, rather is risen again, is at the right hand of the majesty. He can bring you to heaven. He can work out of you everything that God hates so that when God sees you in the end, Jesus says, he's with me. He's been with me for a while now. I've been working with him. He's not who he used to be, Father. I delivered him from the pit, and you wouldn't even know he was ever in a pit. Why? He's sanctified. Amen. My Holy Spirit, I sent my Holy Spirit to him the day he, 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 he was baptized. I gave him my Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit did, Father? You know that Holy Spirit. He started working in him. He started, started convicting him of things that can't come in here. We know how you are, Father. You, you're perfect and you're holy and you by no means will clear the guilty. So I got him out of the category of guilty. Not guilty anymore. He's one of my children. He's one of the ones that you gave me, Father. Remember, you gave me this one. And look what I did. Amen. Look what I did, Father. I sanctified you. Philippians 2.11 says, Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This is, this, you want to, this is my main goal for today. My main goal today, I want to live for Jesus to where God is happy with me. You can be pleased. God can be pleased with you. Are you pleased with God? I don't believe that a mere profession of faith is adequate as proof of divine acceptance. I don't believe you could prove that with the Bible or with an experience. Say, I believe. And because of that, God says, whoa, I accept that one just because he said he believed. Now, and I'm not going to go into all that. The Spirit always produces divine evidence. Always. The Holy Spirit moves in. First thing, he starts work. You got the evidence of having the Spirit, which means you're denying ungodliness and worldly lust, and you're living soberly and righteously in this present generation. That's proof. That's divine proof. I mean, the Holy Spirit produces an environment where sanctification and holiness is possible. You can actually work out your own salvation with fear and trembling if the Holy Spirit is in you. This can really happen. I mean, I know you all know it, but it's good to think about. I know this is true because in Romans 8, 11, Paul says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in your body or in you, he that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body. The one you got right now. This one that 
is of the earth and earthy. This vile body, to what I'm talking about, Paul says that if, let me see what it says here, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, God's going to do something to you. That's what it says. It's what it says. He that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also quicken or make alive. It'll make it to where you can live for Christ even in this vile body. Amen. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, it's just going to tell you. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, all right, you'll live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are the ones that are the sons of God. They are, not, not will be, I mean they will be, but they are. That's why they will be. They are the sons of God. How do I know that? Say, so, well, I'm in a big dilemma. How do I know I'm gonna, are you mortifying the deeds of the body? Are you, are you? Because if you are, you're a son of God. That's what it says. I, I didn't even paraphrase it. God has chosen you to salvation. You say, well, that's it, that's it. We we'll just sit, go home now. He chose me to salvation. Oh, that's the end of the story. No, that's the beginning of the story. There's some work that needs to be done in you. See, I don't need anybody to tell me that, really. I know. I know me. I know the old me. And I need divine grace to get over the old me. Because it was pretty bad. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. God can do it. God can do the work. His son really did die. He really did raise from the dead. And if I die with Jesus, I can really raise from the dead too. That's what it says, right? If you mortify the deeds of the body. It means you kill, you kill the old nature. You put it to death. Now it's a death on a cross, so it's a slow death. Slow. But if you mortify it, if you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. I want to live. God's chosen you. See, what's the direction of that choosing? God did choose you now. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. God chose you. There is a directive or a, a direction of that choosing. See, it doesn't like God just choose everyone and just, you just go off and do your own thing now. No, there's a direction. God chose you. He chose you to salvation, which he chose you to live a life that was free from sin. Now, I know that's, that's hard to say in our generation, but it's the truth nonetheless. He chose you to be saved. Live a life that's free. In other words, live a life that God would be pleased with. Chose you to salvation. Now, how is that salvation going to be worked out? I mean, it's, it's a, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to mandate. I'll just mandate it. I'm God, right? I'll just mandate. You're saved. You're holy. But it doesn't work that way, does it? It doesn't work that way. See, we're, we're not robots. God's got to work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And that is laborious. That's a full-time job, as Brother Fred would say. To salvation. Now, well, how's he going to work salvation in you, the one that, 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 that you, you used to be dead, but now you're alive, he's, he's given you salvation, how's that going to be worked on in you? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now, sanctification of the Spirit doesn't sound, I, I think I used to say sanctification of the Spirit, but I meant sanctification of Bob. In other words, I can do it. Now look, he's already taken my sins away, right? He's already taken my sins away. He put me into Christ. He gave me the Holy Spirit. Now I can do it. Well, that isn't what it says. It doesn't say, now you can do it. It says the Holy Spirit's got some work to do in you. It's the sanctification of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to have to do this work in you. Uh, well, well, the, well, are you just a bystander? No, no, no. He's going to work in you. You. He's not going to work on you. He's going to work in you. Which means you're going to be involved in it. Isn't that? That's great, isn't it? I, I, don't, 
don't want any kind of religion that takes over my body and makes me do all kinds of stuff. I don't drink soda anymore because my church says I shouldn't drink soda anymore. No, I want a Holy Spirit that's working with me, working in me, leading me in the way it paths of righteousness for His namesake. I want a Holy Spirit in me that knows the mind of the Lord. He knows what God expects. He knows the direction of salvation. In other words, the Holy Spirit knows where God's going to put you in heaven. Now, if I can say it like that, speaking as a man, Look at it like an occupation. There's a certain place that God's going to put you, a position, a place. And the Holy Spirit knows what it is, and he's getting you ready to fit in. Just like them blocks. Remember that they built the temple, and they had to be, get them stones ready. They couldn't just get them in there and say, well, cram it in. No, it won't fit. God's going to make you fit. Isn't that good? Holy Spirit's going to make you fit. When you get there, it's not like, oh, we got another oddball. No. You're going to fit perfectly in. There's not going to be the sound of a hammer. You're going to fit right in. Amen. tell you, that makes me feel good. Because, you know, sometimes here you don't fit in. Sometimes here the old nature will crop up and you'll say, I don't feel like I fit in. Just trust God. He can make you fit in. See, we have been saved. It's a very real reality. We've been saved. And at the same time, we're being saved. And pretty soon, we're going to be completely saved. <laughs> and it isn't over with yet. Every aspect of salvation has been finally calculated by God. No surprises to God. Oh, I love this. I love, see, we can't, God doesn't have it. He, known unto God are all his works. Before the foundation of the world, before he ever started this project, he had it all worked out. Now, you can have a confidence in a God like that. It, it, nothing's going to... See, things may arise in our lives, but we don't understand how it fits together. Just we got to trust God. God's got it all worked out. He, he's, he's... Why am I having to go through... It's a wrong question. It's a why. It's a, I get to. Look what I... Look what God... He must have a glorious end. If I got to go through this, if this is what, is there something better on the other side of that temptation? That trial just going to be for a little while. And then he's going to show me the way of escape. And what's going to happen? He is going to be glorified. And that's what Paul's talking about. Sanctification is not just about you. It's about what God's doing in you. Why? Because he's going to get glory. God's all about glory now. If God's not going to get any glory from it, he isn't going to do it. Do we need to be dogmatic on, on aspects of salvation that's been revealed? Not be wishy-washy when it comes. I'm not saying that we are. I'm saying that there's a tendency in man to overlook the, what's been revealed in favor of their opinion of what's been revealed. In the matter of sanctification, there's not any room for opinion. They're just not. He's revealed what he's going to do in Christ Jesus. And it's only as you fall in line with that and you believe the record, you enter into the, whatever, you, whatever it is, Father, if you show me, you work in me, I'll submit to you. See, isn't that what Jesus said? Not my will. Now, I, I, I'm going to argue that if Jesus is in you, he'll teach you how to say that. Not my will. I know it's hard for the flesh to frame those words, but we need to learn those words. Not my will, but thy will be done. I mean, does anybody really believe that God's going to save anyone separate from Jesus? I mean, when you get there, say, well, some of them were, were saved by Muhammad. That's not going to happen. Salvation is only in Christ. So obviously, you're going to have to have Jesus working in you. He's only going to, as far as I can read, I can't find any place in here where God gave anybody to someone other than Jesus. God gave them to Jesus. Remember John 17, it says that. He, he, he gives people to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the only one that can take away their sin. 
Jesus is the only one that can, can teach them how to respond to God properly. Jesus is the only one. Jesus is the only one that knows what the Father wills. See, now, Jesus is working through the Holy Spirit. He said, I'll come to you. Talk about the comforter. He would come to you. He would work in you. We need comfort. This is a process that requires comfort. Uh, I was thinking about this. Now, Hebrews 5, 8 says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And I thought, if Jesus had to suffer when he was here as a man, why would I ever, ever question that he's going to lead me through sufferings? Why would I, why would I do that? Ah, uh, another Jesus. There's another Jesus out there. And that Jesus has never suffered anything. The false Jesus is not a suffering Jesus. He's usually a laughing and a joyful. Everything's funny to this Jesus. Have you, have you heard of this Jesus? I'm sure you have. Doesn't make any, sin doesn't bother this Jesus. No, you don't need to be sanctified to follow this false Jesus because nothing bothers him. Everything's just fine. You can't make him angry. You can't make him happy, really. It says everything's okay. But is that the real Jesus? He learned obedience by the things he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to whoever wants it. That isn't what it says. To, who's, to all of them that obey him. All right, now I say, well, are you preaching salvation by obedience? Well, in that context, I am. If Jesus had to learn obedience by the things he suffered, then how dare anyone concoct the doctrine that allows disobedience to Jesus? How dare someone say you're going to go to heaven if you're disobeying Christ? Well, I know that's a little hard, but the point to see is that salvation produces acceptable fruit. See, the, the point is, is that the Holy Spirit's working in you not to condemn you. He's got enough to... He, he, he could condemn every one of us, but that isn't what he's doing. He's working, producing acceptable fruit because he knows that if you're producing acceptable fruit, the Father will be attracted to you. He'll bless you. Speaking as a man, salvation has many aspects in its application. Sanctification has many aspects as you start as God starts working in you, the Holy Spirit starts, and you start being sanctified, things look different, don't they? Yeah. They look completely different. You, you start growing up in the Christ. The day star dawns, and you realize there's nothing really here worth anything. Everything here is, is just like a veneer. See, the devil, he's the ruler of this world now. He's, he's, he's the God of this world. Why? Because God's using him for a reason. There's a purpose. Satan can't do what he wants to do or you, we wouldn't be here today. He would have done killed us. Satan can't. But see, there's a reason that the world is the way it is. It's going to purge out those who don't really love God. Those who aren't really committed. They really don't want anything to do with heaven or God. They just... They want, actually, they want the best of both worlds. If there is a heaven, well, they'll say, I, I believe in Jesus. So if there is a heaven, they, they'll get to go there too. But while they're here, they have full intentions of, you know, you only go around once. They're going to have everything they can get. Well, the problem with that is you can't have both. You don't get to have both. You got to choose this day who you're going to serve. And if it's God, well, then cut off the flesh, crucify it. Sanctify, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. God's chosen to save men in a way, of, this is important. He's chosen to save men in such a way that every appointed aspect of his character is going to be divulged. This can be seen in sanctification. See, each step of the way, each, each, if you want to call it a layer, each aspect of sanctification is going to reveal to you something about God. And it's not just about you. We have an angelic order looking on. And they're saying, did you see that thing that used to dominate him? Remember that thing that used to dominate him? 
Look at that. He's cast that thing off. What happened? You'll say, oh, remember the Holy Spirit made that request to the throne. He made a request in words that they couldn't even utter. It was like a groaning. He made this request. And remember, our Father, he sent that grace down to them. What happened? They, they saw, oh, that's not good. And they cast it off. What happened? They were being sanctified. And the Spirit, the Spirit was working in them. This is glorifying God. This is showing that salvation is of the Lord. Every single time something, you see it differently and, and you go, that's not as good as I thought it was. God was there. The Holy Spirit was doing his work. Behind the scenes, there's all these angelic words keeping you alive, keep, keeping you able to be able to respond to God. Salvation is of the Lord. All right, so we're not saved primarily because of what we do. Salvation is of the Lord. But what we do, salvation, sanctification will prove that what we do has something to do with it. If you can receive that, I know you can. No person is going to get to heaven and say, I didn't do anything. What are you giving me a crown of righteousness for, God? I didn't do nothing. No, no. God doesn't give out crown of righteousness to people who are lazy and indolent. He doesn't. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. Now, doesn't that have to do with what you do? Doesn't that have something to do with what you do? See, primarily, it wasn't what saved you. It's what Jesus did that saved you. But this continuing work and sanctification where you he revealed things, you cast it off. That was well done. That was good. That was good, but you did it. It was Christ in you, but you're the one that, you, you see, isn't this great? It's, it's great because God it brings us in to salvation. We're being saved. He's doing the heavy lifting, if I can say it like that. He's given you the Holy Spirit that reveals the things, and then he's given you grace to do it. See, it, salvation is of the Lord. Don't, I don't want to be misunderstood here. Salvation's of the Lord, but it isn't apart or separate from you. He's working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We're being saved, and if I want to say it the most, the most perfect way, we're being saved through sanctification and belief of the truth. And we're involved in both of those. We're involved in it. In the world to come, you know, now I, say, I already said this, we, we only have a measure. We only have a measure. You be faithful with the measure you're given. You, you, you measure up to, the, to whatever God's given you, you use it for him. And in the end, he'll say, well done. Well done, son. Every time I, I moved you to repent, you did, I have it right here. I wrote it down in the book every time. Remember those times that you did something wrong? But you came to me and you repented. You said, I, I wish I'd never done that. It's written in the book. God said, well done, son. Well done. You did, you did good with what I gave you. See, this, God's saving us. If he didn't, we wouldn't be saved. In the world to come, if we've been faithful over a few things here, we got good news. <laughs> And the world to come, we're going to be part of something that never ends. And there's no sin there. There's no old man there. There's no disappointment there. Everything is pointed towards perfection. And sanctification gets us ready for that. To where he can say, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Thank you, brethren.